Hey, good morning, and welcome to another edition of In the Spotlight with Commissioner Jeffrey Mims. Hey, this morning we have a very <laughs> special guest. Um, of course, all of our guests are special. <laughs> uh, this is a young man that is um, I was born and raised in Dayton, Ohio. Mr. Yes. Charles Wilkes the yes. second. Yes, sir. Is it the second? All right. Uh, let's let's tell us about yourself. So yeah, I grew up uh, Westwood, um, actually right across the street from Westwood Center, which is now closed. Okay. Uh, my mom pretty much raised me, Teresa Brooks. It just so happens to be her birthday today. So oh, okay. Happy birthday, well, mom! Happy birthday! <laughs> okay. And so I went to uh, elementary school at McNary, which is also now closed. And for my middle school years, I was high, I was a uh, homeschooled. And then from there, in high school, I went to Dayton Early College Academy, also known as DECA, where um, I graduated at 16 years old. I was the uh, first Gates Millennium Scholarship recipient. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that, because I know uh, we had a big run uh, that year in, in Dayton Public Schools with probably about 11 Gates Scholars. Mm -hmm. So that Man. year, yeah, it was, it was a lot of it. We had some at Stivers. We had some at Thurgood. I think I was the only one at DECA. Right. Truly amazing. We went to the State House a couple of times. At the time I think Mayor Ryan McGlynn was there. We went down there. I mean it was it was a it was an amazing point. So for example, if you don't know what scholarship is, yeah, guess what the scholarship. Yeah. yeah. Let's talk about that for so, a minute. So funny about Bill and Melinda Gates. Um I think the inaugural year was two thousand. Um the actually in the inaugural year anybody could apply for the Gates Millennium Scholarship. So you could be high school, you could be college, uh, graduate school, whatever. Okay. Um, I won it in 2009. So the scholarship, what it does is it pays for you 10 years of college, which is everything. Okay. So you get up to five years for um, an undergraduate degree, two years for a master's, four years for a PhD. The only, I guess, stipulation is when you get the master's and the PhD, you have to major in specific areas. So that include education, um, biology, chemistry, and like maybe computer science and like one or two other subjects. Okay. So I took full advantage of it. Um, it's funny, nobody thought I would get it. <laughs> oh, yeah? And I would tell people the long year, I was like, you know what, it's about time we had a gay scholar. Okay. And so, you know, I was fortunate and blessed to win it. The experience of me winning it was amazing. I'll never forget it. I tell the story quite often. Um, yeah. And so yeah. that led to me being able to go to Morehouse College, mm -hmm. historically black college, the only African American all male institution of higher education in the okay. country. What college is that? So, yeah, Morehouse. Yeah. So okay. you, we have, right. uh, so if for those of you who don't know Morehouse, um, it's in Atlanta, Georgia. We've had alumni such as Martin Luther King Jr., Spike Lee, Samuel Jackson, Bakari Sellers, Maynard Jackson, the first black mayor of Atlanta. I mean, the list goes goes on, on, and, on. and on and on. Denzel yeah, Washington's you, Man, you, you're, in, you're in great company. Greatness. Yeah, great company. You know, and um, going back again to the uh, Gates Scholars, mm -hmm. you know, the uh, school district, uh, school district Dayton, had uh, a long run right. of Gates Scholars, probably more than any other school district in the nation, and it surprised a lot of people based upon a lot of things that were going on, and where we challenged mm -hmm. actually the learning, overall learning of uh, the students that we had in the district, and when we looked at some of the types of programs that those young people have been involved in, right? Uh, like yourself, we saw that they were involved in a variety of programs, mm -hmm. uh, music, debate teams, um, all athletic teams, they, I mean, all the kinds of things that we know that sort of set up a young person to be a successful adult, right. if you will. Right. Now, I remember you had a, you had a sweet jump shot <laughs> now, now, and, and the school. Now, where, where'd you take that jump shot? Man, I took that jump shot all the way to, to Belmont. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I had fun there. But, yeah, you're right. Going back to the scholarship, people think it's just by academics, but, no, you have to be well-rounded. So right. you have to have the extracurricular activities. In high school, I did community service. I was in the Botillion. You have right. to have a well-rounded individual because it's not just about the books. The books are just one piece of the pie, right? Right. And so I tried to, not even just my school, but I think in general, I think Dayton Public Schools really try to emphasize creating a real round of individuals that can do more than just either shoot a jump shot or do more than just, you know, solve a math problem. We need people that, that are conscious, that are aware, that are ready mm -hmm. to give back to the community. And the only okay. way you do that is by being involved in your community and being engaged in a lot of different activities right. in different ways. I remember even in high school, we experienced some budget cuts. Um, I wrote a speech and was able to give the speech down at the state house. So I mean, 
all of mm-hmm. those type of experiences are, are important, you know, to make sure that we we continue to move forward. So it yeah. wasn't it wasn't by by happen chance, right? Right. That that, right. that Dayton was able to produce and still produces, you know, great scholars and people to win that scholarship. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I, I know you're talking about writing a speech and speaking about the whole school funding issue. Uh, seldomly do we have a lot of young people who are in college who are aware enough right. of right. the the domino effect, if you will, right. in terms of how politics affects what happens in their in their regular lives. And so when you look at the fact that in um, 19, actually I should know this, easy, 1994, 1997, mm-hmm. excuse me, the um, first Supreme Court ruling in Ohio that declared the way we fund schools to be unconstitutional. So the effects of, of, of that decision right. and the kinds of things that were happening prior to cause school districts to have to make adjustments in terms of cutting programs yeah. that you're, you know, kind of things that you're talking about that benefited you and you and your program were aware enough right. to at least say, okay, look, I got to make a statement here somewhere along the line. Maybe some teacher or some coach or someone made you aware of where you could find information or where you could research that. And you put that together and you took the initiative along with support right. to go to Columbus and testify. Right. You know, seldomly does it happen, even yeah. with adults. Yeah. You know, and, and I know as a, as a lobbyist for the school district, you know, I was one that uh, saw different people come to Columbus. Certainly yeah. it was my job to go to Columbus all the time and, and, and try to argue and debate with uh, legislators about the, uh, the lack of funding and the lack of programming that we had for, uh, for children in the school district. So yeah. it, it's interesting that, that you see that. If you look at the... Uh, political uh, arena today. Mm-hmm. Um, where where do you think we're going, and what would you suggest to other young people, if you mm-hmm. will, oh, yeah. uh, your age, who are involved in society or, or not involved? Uh, yeah. What kind of suggestions would you give to them? Yeah, so it's funny when I when everything you just said. With, well, the word that comes to mind at first is empowerment, mm-hmm. and we have to we have to empower people. We have to make sure people are, are financially literate, politically literate. In the, in the age of information now, it's all about access. I remember watch, watching a sound clip about Denzel Washington. He said, you know, the problem that's going on is everybody got to be first. News okay. reporters, they first. What's first? Get the information yeah. out there. He said, there's no longer value in telling the truth. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I think it's very important in the society we live in now for us to be able to decipher alternative facts yeah right to, to know what are some of the underlining assumptions and and hidden messages and policies and so how do you do that well for me I, i've always been one i'm not an expert so i try to find people who are experts mm-hmm. and i ask tons and tons and tons and tons of questions also we have access to tons of videos so you have documentaries like 13th you know who talks about yeah. why you know black men are constantly disproportionately being incarcerated you know, you have a lot of other films that talk about why there was the economic downfall, you know, back in 2008. So making sure that we find in people that are experts in these different areas. Right. We're being a little bit more aware and conscious, watching the news and then watching documentaries, watching because the, I mean, the information is there. I think the, the skill that we have to learn now as, as a people is to be able to decipher what's real and what's not. Yeah. You know, and I think that's so <clears throat> hard because we're getting we're, we're drowning in information. So it's hard to be able to critique and say, is that true or is that true? And yeah. so to me, I think about empowerment. It doesn't matter if you don't know. It doesn't matter if you're 20 or you, you're 30, you're 40, you're 50. You can get into this, right. this art. You can get into it at any moment. Everybody plays a role in there. Everybody does something. It's not. You might have the speaker. You might have the organizer. You might have the writer, right? You might yeah. have the people that are supporting, providing the meals. But I think we have to... We have to come together and understand that everybody plays a particular role and that we have to stick together. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. like, the, it's like the African proverb said. I mean, it takes a village. It takes a village, yep. right? And if we want to go fast, you go alone. But if we want to mm-hmm. go far, you know, we have to go together. Yeah. You know, and, and I noticed um, early on in your career, once you left, you know, remember you leaving, being involved in the Botillion, being Mr. Botillion, yes. um, and uh, a very popular uh, young brother <laughs> in that process. 
And uh, e even that whole process was just fun. Oh yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And we Still talk cool about with them that. Brothers yeah. Too. Yeah. <laughs> and, and and see, and that's it's like a fraternity because especially now, with the, the internet mm -hmm. and Facebook and all the other kind of things that you younger people are connected <laughs> with, you know, you are able to connect with each other so easily. Right. And I know when I talk with uh, you know Gerard, who also with yeah. the, with the Decca, who works with me a lot with the Botillion uh, continuously. Uh, you, have, you have uh, contact with Norris Cole, who was in the Botillion, I think, in 2007. Yeah. And, and so you look at the fake news kind of stuff that's out there. Yeah. And but one of the things I noticed about you very early is that when you were home and would see you at different events, you would always seek, seek out those individuals who you thought had knowledge and you would ask for their business card. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yep. Yep. And you asked for the business card, and that way you were always able to, you know, sort of communicate and, and maintain some contact, mm -hmm. which goes back to validate what you said earlier to not just listen to the news on the media in terms of right. what they're saying about certain things, that you were in a position then to seek out experts. Right. You know, uh, as it's far true. as what was happening. So, um, so I'm happy in, some, in many regards that at least you asked for my business card as well. Yeah. You, had, you had all my information, but you know, so, you know, so that that's the good you thing. Got to go to the experts. Yeah. Now, uh, community involvement. I know. So a few years ago, mm -hmm. we had um, a major kickoff yep. dealing with uh, learn to earn. Yep. And I I can't tell you how proud I was to have two of my mentees. <laughs> to be asked to come back and talk to young people and talk to adults about right. the importance of education, the importance of reading. And when I'm in this room and I see you and Norse <laughs> yeah. standing up there talking and holding court and everybody just, you know, <laughs> waited with bated breath for whatever words <laughs> gonna come out of your lips next. <laughs> right. You know, I mean, my, my heart was, was just chest, you know, just pumping, you know, I said, damn, boy, had contact with these brothers, man. And, you know, and of course, the, the, the goal for all of us adults, especially those who are teachers right. and mentors, uh, parents, coaches, mm -hmm. is for those that we touch to go beyond exactly. where we are. Exactly. And so when we look at that selkie, man, we sort of plant these seeds, we water them, we fertilize them. And these young brothers and young people, they're moving on to the next level right. because they are the next leaders as far as our community is concerned. Right. Man. Now, how, 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 how do you feel, I guess, I know you got a younger brother. Mm -hmm. You work with him much in terms of his attitude, thoughts? Yeah, so in so many ways, I, I've been, so being away in Atlanta, and yep. then now being in Michigan, okay. you know, which I, I'm a lot closer, I, I've been trying to think about more ways to give back, even now. Okay. That's another thing, I feel like, you know, you're never, too old or too young to be able to give back. I think that should be something immediately that you can do. So for me, me doing that, I try to do it through the learn, earn, do different events like that. Mm -hmm. I'm now in the process, this will be the first year where I've created a scholarship with some of my um, my boys from, from DECA, where we're giving out scholarship to two graduating okay. seniors this year. Okay. Giving back two small $500 scholarships. And I mean, it's just, it's just little things. Yeah. I, and not even here, because I think you also have to be, you have to bring that same drive awareness to wherever you are. So mm -hmm. if I was in Atlanta, I'm tutoring, I'm reading kids in Atlanta. Right. If I'm in Michigan, like now, I teach financial literacy to 7th to 10th graders. Mm -hmm. So I've done that, which is very important. Budgeting, writing checks. I mean, all of these things are, are survival skills that you may or may not learn. It. And we tend to make assumptions that students are going to learn that, and they, they typically don't. Mm -hmm. So I try to do it in a, in a, in a wide variety of ways. Um, now I'm in the process of trying to come back and maybe hold workshops at different schools and maybe offer okay. professional development. But um, yeah, yeah, I try to I try to do yeah. it no matter where I am. Yeah, well, you know that that uh, same attitude is one that was embraced by Martin Bayless, mm -hmm. uh, another kid who was in the Botillion, right? Uh, uh, young man, I should say at this point in time, also played uh, football, basketball, and baseball at Belmont. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in the Botillion, I think it was 84 uh, when mm -hmm. he came out of Botillion. But he was, um, played football for, uh, I think, Western Michigan, and okay. then he went to Buffalo. Okay. And San Diego, Kansas City. 
I'm not sure where he ended up. I think Kansas City may have been his last place that he played. But in each city that he um, played sports in, right, he had a free football camp. Yeah. And the foundation, since he lived in San Diego, that's where his major foundation was. Right. And or that's where it was located. And so he's also, of course, with his hometown, had this free football camp as far as Dayton is concerned as well. I think it's probably now maybe it's, I don't know, it could be 28 years that he's uh, had it's this amazing. free football camp it's in amazing. Dayton. And so it goes back in line with what you're talking about in terms of finding a way to give back. Uh, I, I have a problem sometimes with the, uh, or concern with, Maybe the media, if with regards to not communicating mm-hmm. as broadly as I think they should, mm-hmm. all of the, especially the African American athletes who right. are doing things right. in their communities, right. we hear about those who are not, of course, right. always. because they always make a lot of news. But we have a wide variety of those who are doing very significant things in their communities, totally aside from the sport or from the entertainment world that they're involved in, but they use those uh, those dollars that they've generated in those areas to come back and give back to their community. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Why do you think um, those uh, things are not publicized to the extent that uh, that they are? It's, it's all about um, perception and image. I mean, people want to sell stories. They know what tends to bite, what gets people attention, what gets people rattled up, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, it's at the expense and cost of and it's more times than not historically black people or historically mm-hmm. marginalized groups of people mm-hmm. who we fail to capture the the other side the outside stories right the right. the work that they're doing i think it is really about <clears throat> the perception i think if you look at the history of the united states and how you know let's say you take a black person who was once considered to be three-fifths of a person like all of those things race all mm-hmm. that it's still here Mm-hmm. You know, there, racism has not gone away. This is not a post-racial, uh, post-racism um, generation. You know, it's just more subtle. Okay. And so I think it's even more important for us. If you think about, if you think about social media, right? You have access. You can do Facebook Live. You can do Snapchat. You can have. You can post pretty much anything. It might be useful to start using social media as a means to build people up to actually yeah. because now we have the space to. So before, like you say, something during, during the civil rights movement, it was a powerful to. For that to be seen on TV because that's mm-hmm. the news source. Like yep. that's how information is getting communicated. Like you don't have access to that, but your phones now, the different apps, we have uh, the actually the ability to start painting a different picture of of ourselves. Whether you're black, brown, red, yellow, white, we can take a little bit of ownership in that. But mm-hmm. that's that's what it is. When you have mm-hmm. money and you you know that there's particular stories that tend to sell, there's stigmas that some of us have eternalized that are not true. Right, you know, when you have all of that working right now, people are and let's and I haven't even mentioned people are traumatized, right? When you yeah. when you go through racism and you see all of the same mistakes being repeated over and over and over, mm-hmm. people are literally traumatized. And there's mental health, and that's that research that's picking up yeah. now. There's a lot of need yeah. for mental health awareness, yeah. but I think it all comes back to the point of there are particular stereotypes, perspectives that are continuing to get highlighted and pushed forward at the sake of people that are actually doing the work mm-hmm. that can really help and change the, the dynamics and really provide hope to, yeah. p- for, to people that have not typically had the chance for upper mobility. Yeah. And it's sad. Yeah. Um, you know, I was in Washington, D.C. Well, actually, I was there uh, last week, uh, but I was there in December right. during the last um, month of President Obama's uh, term in office. And we were there in a, in a conference he was having, dealing with My Brother's Keeper, mm-hmm. My Brother's Keeper's initiative that he initiated in 2014. And he was talking about the issue of how, of course, we understand that there are a lot of challenges that our young African-American males are experiencing that are uh, more challenging, if you will, mm-hmm. than they are for any other groups of individuals. Right. And certainly some of them by design. Right. And... His whole initiative is the is the effort of both creating the awareness, such as what you talked about, and also giving young people, young uh, African American males in particular, a set of skills right. that allow them to or to help them to navigate through all of these different challenges. Right. Um, 
And one of the bigger skills that we talked about was this whole this whole set of social skills. Right. You know, one of the main ones is how do you identify and resolve conflict at its lowest level? Right. Because understanding people are going to come at you wrong. Mm -hmm. Some are going to come at you right. How do you make a decision to respond when someone comes at you incorrectly? Right. And, and I'm asking this question of you because clearly we understand all these challenges out there. Right. And you have individuals who have issues right and something didn't go right at home and and they bring it to the workplace or they bring it to school or they bring it to whatever right. setting that they're yeah. involved in how have you been so successful in navigating through <laughs> all these different challenges right and we know they're there because just like we say we know there's a certain tinge of racism that's continuously there right how have you been successful in navigating through that uh and still having maintained a high level of respect mm -hmm. from so many diverse groups. Right. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's an amazing question. Um, first, I got, I got to give it up to God because okay. <laughs> to All make right. it through, you know, you have to, whoever, you know, you pray to or whatever spirituality you have, that, that's that balance, that's that peace because it's not just me. It's some situations yeah. that I've been in, it, it, it had to be mm -hmm. a, higher, a higher power. Um, so first I'll say that. In addition to that, um, I think I tried to really listen to what my mom said. Okay. You know, growing up, I mean, she's from the South, and you know, her grandparents tell her stories about what it was like. So she always would tell me, you know, you have to be clean cut. You know, you have to wear a suit. It's always yes sir, no sir. You get pulled over, turn the lights on. I mean, you have to make sure that you go over and beyond, even if you're wrong. You have to go over and beyond. And so even somebody like me, who I, I've gotten pulled over. So you said being, go over and beyond being courteous. Courteous, being courteous, right. right. Because see, that's, that's the big challenge that we have sometimes as young uh, black males, even older. Right. Is the fact that we have this macho. Yeah. Okay, it's this macho attitude that, you know, I ain't going to be chumped out. Right. Okay, you can't chump me out. I don't care if you got a badge and a gun, you know, knife. You know, I ain't going to be chumped out. However. Right. Okay. So. Understanding that, so then go ahead in terms of so yeah, even I was, I was gonna say even somebody so all of that so I agree with what you said all of that being said I still I still get pulled over now I get mm -hmm. pulled over just because of the car that I drive mm -hmm. like who is this black young brother up here you know in Michigan you know getting pulled over then I and I say you know I'm a graduate student I'm, I'm going to the grocery store and and they say yeah. okay have a good day or or I get pulled over and a lady and I'll never forget this one. I got pulled over so much, and this was the day I was leaving campus after studying midnight. She said, you know what? I'm not even going to say nothing because I don't want you to have a bad report of us. I literally got pulled over so much that the lady said, I'm not even going to say anything. Hmm. And, I, and that's just amazing, right? So even though I did all the things that my mom said, somebody like me, right, who, you know, you, I should be able to get a pass. And no, I, I experienced the same exact thing even doing that. So it just tell, it just says to you like, even if you do all of this, you still I I still have to be overcouraged. I still right. have to you know for yeah. lack of better terms play the game. And I mean, is it right? No, but you have to look at the bigger picture. And so I've always looked at the bigger picture because this exactly. is me is bigger than me. <laughs> you is bigger than you. Like we represent more than just who we are in a given moment. And so I know that I have things that I have to do. And I was just telling another student the other day. You know, she's like, what do you do? When, you know, when you're tired, you don't want to go no more, you want to quit school or whatever. And I, and I told her, I said, I said, what's your name? And she told me her name. I said, I'll do it for you. Mm -hmm. I said, you know what? <clears throat> because, you know, 10, 15 years from now, there's going to be another student. Gonna, and he's going to ask you the same thing. You. And then it's going to be up to you. What did you do in that 10 you, or 15 you, you, years? You got to be that role model, that support system. You got to. I mean, you know, t time is flowing by as I knew it would. It goes by so quickly. <laughs> um, and I know, I mean, I, we could talk. Oh, uh, indefinitely, uh, and because I think this home. is this is really really important. And, uh, we're gonna probably have to do this again. The the thing that I want to also say to you, of course, I need to get you back uh, when we have maybe one of our men of color conferences in terms of things that we're doing with these young men, because we have something planned coming up this fall okay. uh, between the city, uh, Dayton Public Schools, United Way, and Sinclair, where I would love for you to be one of our uh, featured speakers 
in terms of addressing young men? Because I think that that question, again, going back from a survival perspective, right, and how you navigate through all these challenges and roadblocks that we know are there, right, okay, how do you navigate through those and still find your way to the other side without getting beat up, distracted, um, harmed, or maimed, or, or unfortunately uh, find yourself in a situation where you've lost your life, right, and. And, and sometimes we have young people that maybe don't realize who the other victims are mm. because something happens to you. Right. And how many friends and family members you have that are mourning your loss. And yeah. the bigger issue is how much of what we as a society lose because of your potential productivity. Right. So again, we're gonna come back. Uh, you know, times times about up, uh, yeah. and so I, I look forward to talking with you again. And sure, uh, sure. of course, we always yeah. talk, but <laughs> we've been trying to get you on this on this show for a while. Yeah. So uh, again, I just have to say to our audience, yeah, you know, this has been another edition of In the Spotlight with Commissioner Jeffrey Mims, and I'd like for you to, in addition to uh, finding this on the uh, City of Dayton website, that you can also go on YouTube. And you can just plug in in the spotlight with Commissioner Jeffrey Mims and you get this information and you can share it. So, again, I'd say very thank, uh, big thank you to our guest, Mr. Sure. Charles Wilkes, yes, sir. You know, the second. <laughs> and uh, keep on doing what you're doing, brother. We're yes, proud of you. And you're, you have your doctorate degree pretty soon, right? Yes. In the next year or two, I will be Dr. Wilkes. Okay. And I'll be ready to start the next chapter of my life. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks again, man. No problem. Thank you. And thank you, audience.